Heavenly Father, we know Jesus is coming right on time. So we want to be on time now. We just ask for your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's do a brief review what we covered yesterday. I somewhat apologize because we only got seven texts in and I wanted to do the whole thing. But, and that was in an hour and a half. So, you, so I did much too much talking yesterday. And what we want to be able to do is duplicate. What's that word? duplicate what we're doing here in your living room and hopefully you do it in a way where they can duplicate it in their homes and after a while you have five or six small groups doing this same thing with these same packets and I promise you it can happen because it's happening right now in my district and my district is no different than your district and even though you may not carry the title of pastor remember July 15 I won't either I've already briefed my whole district take my name Pastor Linwood Spangler take the word pastor off and just call me just Lynn because there will be a new pastor coming after me and I want him to fill the shoes of the new pastor. Thank you for that whisper, amen. I, I just heard, unless I'm hearing things, I heard one out there and it's okay. We want to make room for the next guy that comes along because the Lord wants to use him too. Let's do a brief review. What topic did we cover last time, yesterday? Bible. The Bible. Why? Oh, you got to think about that one. Sorry? It's true. It's all right every verse told us after that it's the words of God amen it's the power that we need as Christians to change us and to help us what understand, understand what salvation I want to really test your memory what did we use instead of the word salvation because we want to talk like non-Christians to non-Christians peace there you go I don't know whether you're here yesterday but that word came out and it was really good to take the place of salvation. The peace of mind. That's right. Oh, I forgot. I marked it up there and I was asking you. We still had silence. All right. The second text is from Paul where he said the word of God is sharper. Not sharp. Sharper. More cutting. It'll get right to the crux where all the joints connect. I don't know whether you have this challenge. The older we get, the more we have problem with our joints there you go and so the word of God gets right down pierces through all that muck of life liberal conservative whatever Democrat Republican and gets right to the purpose as to why we are who we are it goes on and divides the mess of life and gets to where the change needs to take place what does what does the word of God thank you not our word or the pastor's word or anything else hopefully it's the same but it's the word of God it is a discerner of our intents as to why we are who we are and then it also judges and what's another phrase for judging setting wrongs right let's say it together setting wrongs right what sets wrongs right the God's Word, that's right. The judging, setting wrongs right, very important. And then we talked yesterday about everything we do not only influences us whiteheads. If you're not whitehead, forgive me, I don't want them to exclude you. That got me off on another story, but I won't go there. But it should also include what? The youth. And our youth will plug in, get excited about what we're excited about. I went to this, uh, this class way back 40 years ago. I can't believe I'm saying this right now. But it, I remember my father used to say statements like 40 years ago. I went, been to, been, went to a class when I was a vice president of a company called Act Enthusiastic. And you know, that was called How to Win Friends and Influence Pre People. Did anybody know who put it on? Dale... Dale Carnegie that's right my boss the owner of the company I was vice president for said Lynn I want to send you away to this class I said really he said yeah he says I'll pay for it it was like a thousand dollars then so I went there and watched people that were so embarrassed to say their name that they got up there and told stories about themselves every night it was like the most enthusiastic church I had ever gone to and the stories I learned, I'll never forget them. I mean, I saw these timid little ladies up there. They were secretaries at their workplace, and they'd stand up and tell stories from their childhood. And they got so excited, you thought they were a professional lecturer. And I remember this statement, if you remember it. It goes like this. Act 
enthusiastic and you'll be enthusiastic. I think it plugs into our life with Christ. If we aren't enthusiastic about Christ, how in the world is our young people going to be enthusiastic about what we believe and hold up? Act enthusiastic. If you're going to be a youth leader, the first thing you need to be is enthusiastic. And so that's what we're trying to do. And that's why we study this topic first. It's a very basic, fundamental principle that everybody that's studying with you in your community should believe in the Word of God. All right? All right, we found out it's a cleansing process for our youth because a good enthusiastic individual wants to remain clean and then we are told by Paul to do what study anything great that you accomplish in your life it requires studying that's why we're here that's why you spend so many hours in this facility on these beautiful campgrounds and come and spend this quality time together we are studying and we are being enthusiastic or it says here we are what being eager about the Word of God because we're looking for the gold amongst the gold mine. You know, it's there. We just got to dig for it. And then present yourselves to God. Now, here I want to stop because we talked a little bit about it yesterday and I really missed the big point of it all. If you're having trouble getting the meat out of the Word, think about the contrast to what you're reading. The opposite of. Do you remember how to prove a math problem? Two plus two equals? Oh, I'm in a good community. It still means that. It still equals that. These days the math has changed so much. I don't know whether that's true or not. All right. To prove that, simply, you reverse the? Reverse the procedure. Okay. Reverse the? Instead of two plus two, it becomes? Four minus two equals? Two, all right? The same numbers are shifted and the signs change. So when you're looking at this, it says present yourself. Key point. After you've studied eagerly, you present yourself before who? Do we need to do that for his benefit? Oh, we're on the same page. God knows us before he created Adam. Acts 17, 26 says you were in the blood of Adam. Adam and he knew when he created Adam what time period you would be born in and what place you would live all in Acts 17 26 that was a wow moment when I really unpacked that verse there's nothing that's unexpected to God so we present ourselves now the contrast to presenting yourself before God which is your value not God's value I mean God treasures us we'll never lose our value in the mind of God throughout eternity regardless whether we end up in heaven or hell we still are of the same value to God he always will love us in the memory that he cannot forget us that's how much he loves us. So the opposite of presenting yourself it comes up in the first few chapters of what book? Ah, oh, come on, that's right. When Adam and Eve disconnected from God and ate that fruit, they did what? They disconnected and they hid themselves. Now, if you have a child, you know did something. Mm, that's a nip normal mic. They start cracking and popping in humidity. When you have a child in their teenage years and you know they did something wrong. Don't answer. I want you to think about it. What is your human response? The beautiful thing about God is whenever we do something wrong intentionally and we did it for our reasons, God doesn't abandon us. He comes to us. Mount Sinai, over 300,000 Egyptians with his people. He said, make me a sanctuary for what purpose? Were they the best people on planet earth? No, they made the golden calf. But he says, I want to come and dwell among you. If that doesn't get you excited, even when I've told it, 
a hundred plus times I'm still getting goosebumps saying it because God doesn't abandon us when we do wrong he comes to us for the reason of embellishing us with love in our most ugly time of our life he said study now remember <laughs> this is Paul whose name was Saul, and if this doesn't get you excited, I don't know what does. He said, study and be eager. Why? What you'll discover is God wants you to come and present yourself before him, knowing that he's such a loving God, regardless what your condition is right now, he said, God's waiting on you to come to him. Come to him. He's coming to you because he never left you that's right he's always with you he will never leave you as we found in last night's message four, five times in that verse the original says I will not I will not I will not I will not leave you and so now he says study and be eager about your study and then present yourself here I am God you know my needs I'm talking to you not because you need to hear me but because when we vocalize it, whether in our thoughts, in our prayer, or with our lips, when we say it, all of a sudden, we're lining our radar right up to receive His grace from heaven. Amen. Tonight, we're going to talk about grace versus blessing. Every day, you have God's blessing. What do you say? But we need to be looking for and expecting His grace. Thank you. Grace is something miraculous blessing you receive it every day because God loves every single human being every breath you breathe you're breathing in blessing but there's something miraculous about grace so you present yourself otherwise if you don't study and if you're not eager about what you're reading then you do not hmm. Hmm. I lost you I'm talking too much my wife told me that when I began today if you don't study, you're not eager, you will not present yourself to God. You won't. Because the human nature is that we hide from God. Amen? We saw it in the first story of the Bible. If you exclude Job being the first book. God says, this is the human nature when you unplug from God. You run away from it. Why is it that kids don't want to come to school, uh, come to church? School too, maybe. But why is it that they don't want to come to church? Because they get unplugged. And they know in their heart. Because they were created in the image of God. He says, study, be eager about it, present yourself to God, and don't hide from Him. He'll st still search you out. Adam, Eve, where are you? Did God know where they were? Sure he did. He went to them. But he wanted them to think, where are you right now in your thoughts? You're disconnected. And then they started blaming someone else. You know the story. Wherever you are in that state of darkness, the word of God is a lamp. We have a lamp in our room. I got late last night, Peggy turned out the light, and I wasn't ready for the light to be turned out. And she said, Lynn, turn on the, the lamp. You're sticking with me. Good, that's good. Turn on the lamp. It's a little bit smaller period of light when you want it to be smaller. And then he repeats and enlarges. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light. When you need it, it's bright. It shows you where you need to go. And as a result of that passage, we can say today that the Bible is the Word of God, and in one word, it will what? Sanctify. You're engaged. That's right. It will sanctify. And that's a holy word, because the Sabbath is also part of the sanctifying process. Ezekiel 2012 and 2020, it's all about God's people being set apart in the Sabbath. The Sabbath came before sin came. Hello. The Sabbath came before sin came. It was part of that process of making God's people excited, enthusiastic 
about the holiness process that we don't even understand. Sanctifying God's people through the word, it is truth. And then finally, we found yesterday through the book of Job, the oldest book in the Bible, written by Moses before the Decalogue, that he said, I've gone through trials, but I have not, what? Back. Gone back. I have not gone back from the word of God. I have not gone back from the commandments of his lips, of his mouth, even in Job's time. Job knew the word of God came from God. Isn't it amazing? 2023. The most intellectual people still are debating this point. That Job knew the answer to thousands of years ago. This comes from God. It's his means of communicating with us. And if your children never set foot, one foot, one step in your church, please help them to realize this fact. This is God communicating to them. If they never go to church, open up the book. The book. The Word of God. All right, so let's go further. That took me 15 minutes. We're going to put the hammer down a little bit more. Peggy's over there. I asked her to write on the board. If she can't write on the board, who would volunteer to write in a similar large pattern of this? We're going to see how many real teachers we have here. Come on, there's a school teacher that can write on the board. Somebody's pointing to somebody else. You know what happens when you point somebody else. You're going to be up here writing on the board now. <laughs> Is she? Okay, are you going to point over there too? And, and, and <laughs> Come on, come on up here and help me, please. I thank you. Now, you're not going to be able to put your stickies in your Bible, but maybe you can catch up tonight. Oh, praise the Lord. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to try to put the pedal down. Yesterday we were in first gear. Today we're going to go into second gear. We're going to try to get into the next study. So the next thing we would put up there is the text. It would be B8. And what would the text be? Psalm 119, 11. Let's go back there quickly. Psalm 119, 11. All right. Verse 11. You'll notice this is our third time in Psalm 119. And that's not an accident. It is intentional because this is the longest chapter in the Bible and has a lot of meat for us. What's the verse again? 11. All right. Somebody want to read it real quickly? The man's there waiting for you. Put your hand up for the microphone. And before you read, what's the first thing you do when you land on that verse? Put the next sticker on, which is, should be the sticker number B9. We're reading B8, but you're putting B9 in the text. Is that clear? That was one person. Is that clear? Yes. All right. I want to make sure we're at the same place because I've had somebody tell me already when I got to the last verse, I had one too many stickers. I said, there's something wrong. And come to find it out, all their stickers were in the wrong place. It's very easy to do until you get used to this pattern. All right. Somebody want to read it quickly? You have the microphone. 119. Verse 11. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Ooh, okay. Where's the meat in that verse? Quickly, let's move along today. Where's the meat in it? Who's speaking here? God through David. Thank you, David. All right, and what does he say he does? Very intentional action here. What is it? All right, who's he speaking to? God in like a prayer, and he says what? Thy word. Does he believe this is God's word? Yes or no? Yes. And what does he do? Hides it where? In his heart. Didn't we already learn that we're supposed to place the word in our heart? In the center of our thoughts and feelings? It is the core principle of who you are. Because if you don't hide this in there, guess what? The devil's going to fill your heart with television and every other diversion. Your cell phone now, if you don't sit in front of a television, you can watch hours and hours and hours of TV on your phone. Can you imagine? If you don't hide his word, the word of our creator God, the same lips that spoke the sun into existence, if you don't hide his word there, it will be filled with something else. And that's what's happening with our young people. You can't compete with media. 
Our young people will go where their desires take them. They need to see the treasure of God's Word in your life. Therefore, they will have a safety net from falling into the hands of the devil. All right, I'm preaching again. Sorry. David spoke to God. What? His word. Hide the Word in heart. All right. So then, B9 is what text? Get ready to read that to us. Somebody put your hand up. The microphone will be passed around to you. Matthew 4, 4. Thank you so much for doing the writing. It really releases me to get excited and move along here. Matthew 4, 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. All right. Now, come on. You've got to be getting used to this now, and you know what we're looking for. What are we looking for? The meat of the word, that's right. Where's the beef? <laughs> Forgive me, I shouldn't have said that. Anyway, where's the meat of the word? All right? Thy word. Thy word. Again, what's the common denominator between the last few verses? Whose word is it? God's word. Keep bringing that back because at this point, that invisible person that's sitting beside of you that does not know God, does not come to church, but trusts you enough to be there and looking at this, they have to make a decision right now. And what is that decision? That's right. This is whose word? God's word. And it's important that you teach them to make decisions when? Now. You ask them. We have seen it over and over. All these different writers telling us that whose word this is? God's word. Do you want God's word to come into your life? The lover of all lovers, the one that loves you constantly, never changes, and all of those truths that you can share with them in principle, do you want to hear the word of God and get them to start saying yes to what the Bible teaches? Why? They've got a hill climb coming. Because when you want to hear God's word, there's change coming. And reinforce the opportunity to say yes every time you can. If you really have a loving relationship with this person, you may ask them every word, every verse, do you believe what you just read? And if they're really enjoying what they're experiencing, they will say yes at every verse. And you're teaching them a pattern of righteousness, a pattern of right doing. And they'll appreciate the time with you because it's all uplifting. Yes, I agree with it. Yes, David spoke this as God's word. Yes, these are Matthew's words giving to us. And now he's saying what else in that verse? Read it back to me again. We don't need to read it with a microphone. Just say it quickly. Come on. Oh, I live. We're at Matthew 4.4, 4, correct? All right. What does it say? All right. That's right. So mankind needs something besides bread. Is that true? Yes or no? I don't know about you, but I stopped eating bread. I, I love bread. I used to bake bread. You know, that was one of my first jobs in high school at Highview Academy to pay for my education there. I love bread, but I've stopped eating it because bread hangs around me too much. Oh, anyhow, that'll hit you on the way home. Not the bread, but the thought of it. Thy word is what we need. We need God's word. We need something besides the bread. At this time when he's writing it, you never left home without bread. The first time I went to Africa, I traveled trying to get this accountant that was my assistant in the evangelistic series to get him a, a visa to come to America. I thought it'd be easy. I said, let's go to Nairobi and let's get you a, a visa while I'm here. I want you to come to America. You have great talents. He was only making like $16 a month for a CPA accountant I said this is ridiculous I want to get you to America so I traveled to Nairobi with me and his loving mother his loving mother gave me the bread of that country it was like a staple it was called Ugali anybody know what Ugali is Whew! I will never forget it I'm riding on a bus for six hours in the heat of Africa with this loving big brother he looked like a football player CPA accountant 
And I, th I said, it's time to eat. Uh, and he, and I, I thought once we stopped along these mutt huts, that their little children come out there with another whole story I'll tell, share with you another time. All of a sudden, the kids come out and said, I want to get something. He said, oh, my mother made you something very special. It tested my love for Africa. And if you're listening from Africa, forgive me. It was flour and oil. That was it. It was made into a cake. And it was like eaten tofu with some kind of oil in it. And I don't think their oil was made from other things besides Miss Piggy. Are you with me? I got that in my mouth. I had to eat enough of it to help him to understand I appreciated the gift. But I didn't need any more than I had to. <laughs> we need more than what man can provide for us to be sustained until the trumpet sounds. That's what he's trying to share with us. We need the word of God. It is even more valuable than bread itself. In this time, bread was the staple of every meal. We need the word of God. And it comes forth from the? The mouth of God. Again, the, sin, the, sin, the same principle is in all of these verses. All of these writers are reinforcing. Get it. It's the word of the creator God. He spoke and it came into existence. A son, like we can't imagine how odd it is. He spoke and he brought in all the detail of all the animals, the trees, and the life that we see around us. And if we don't believe it, as Christians, we're going to see it. You know that, right? We're going to see God create again. You're going to see it with your own eyes. And I hope it's in the same sequence, in the same time frame, so that we will never have doubt about the six-day creation again. There's highly trained theologians still debating whether a day equals a year and whether a day equals a thousand years in the mind of God and all the complexity of everything he created. It, it's got to be longer than a 24-hour cycle. Wrong. We're going to see it with our own eyes. There will be no room for doubt or disconnecting from the truth of God's word ever again. I'm preaching. Sorry. I appreciate your writing. Let's go on. Matthew chapter 4 verse 4. Did I leave any meat out of that verse? Yes or no? I guess that's a no. All right. So the next verse would be what? B10, which is what verse? 5. I'm sorry. In the same book? Thank you. John 5.39. Remember, treat me like I've never been to church and I don't know about the Bible. Okay? Get in the practice of speaking language that they understand and addressing them in a way that they don't have any problem understanding. All right. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John 5.39. The first thing you do is... Put the next sticker, and the next sticker is B11. All right, B11. And what does that verse, what does that B11, well, we'll go to that in a minute. All right, verse 39. Put your hand up and please read aloud. One clear up front here, good. Keeping this man awake. I don't want him to fall asleep standing up. That'd be a sad commentary. All right. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. All right. Who's he speaking here? John speaking to? Yeah, Jesus. All right. Jesus speaking to? The Pharisees. the Pharisees. And he already is telling them, you do what? You. You, you search. You search. Was that a good thing? Yes or no? Yes. yes. He's already making a point, contact point. Now remember, this person beside you. He's trying to see the value of the Word of God. And I'd ask him at this point, are you searching for something better than what you have in life? Of course, that's why I'm here sitting beside of you. Good, we're doing the right thing then, aren't we? You're searching for something, a better way of life. Search, what now? 
the scriptures. Again, Jesus is affirming what they're already doing. And so you affirm that person sitting beside of you word by word, thought by thought. You're affirming what they're doing so that they will want to do it again soon. All right? Search the scriptures and investigate. And mine goes on in the Amplified because this is what gives you in the Greek. Pour over the scripture. Can you think of anything in your life? And I don't want you to tell me. I want you to think about it. That you have poured yourself into. Think about driving down the road and you have your cup of drink in the morning. Maybe it's water to get you awake. Whatever wakes you up. And all of a sudden you slam on the brakes because you're in heavy traffic. And that cup does what? Spills. And that water does what? Gets in every crack that you don't want it to get into. He's using terminology to connect with us. He says... Pour yourself over the scriptures. And again, he's talking to people that are already doing this. You search, investigate, and pour yourself over the scriptures, and then the word comes in and amplified diligently. Diligently. Because, he's saying to the people that already do this, because you suppose and trust, there's that word from last night, that you already have what? Eternal life. So he's talking to people that is trying to save themselves by studying the scriptures. They were so secure in studying the scriptures, they were so secure that they were better than everybody else. They called them Jews. They knew their lineage coming down through as the Bible told them who their father was. You could trace it clear back to Adam in this time. He says, you think you have eternal life through these actions. And you're so secure in what you're already doing, Seventh-day Adventist Christians, are we searching for Jesus in every verse? You're supp you suppose and trust that you have eternal life through them. Through what? The Word, the, the verses, the scrolls, the Old Testament scrolls. We many times don't value the Old Testament as much as we do the New Testament. God's Jesus speaking to him and saying, you're so clingy to these Old Testament scrolls, you think those scrolls are going to save you. Jesus is about to give them a 9.0 Richter scale earthquake in their life because what's he say? These are the very scriptures testifying about Jesus, and that was not a good moment for him to speak that because they were not believers in Jesus yet. Some of them went on to re-amplify, kill him, crucify him because they didn't choose to receive the belief that came from Jesus. All right? So Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, he's reaffirming what he's doing. He's saying, you're pouring yourself over it. Boy, this is a teacher. Hallelujah. You're really good at this. All right. He diligently, because in them you think you have eternal life, but he says, they're testifying of me standing before you. And if you have doubt about me right now, you need to go back and read the scrolls. Because there were over 50 prophecies prophesying that Jesus, the Messiah, would be there. And he says, you love these scrolls, you think they're going to save you, but you don't accept me. What's wrong here? They weren't connected to God. They were connected to the scrolls. They were connected, may I bring the rubber down to the road? They were connected to what we do every morning in church. But friends, if the church don't make us more like Jesus, we're not connected to God. And we try to convince other people to become Seventh-day Adventists because we want them like us, God forbid. We should be pointing them to Jesus and hoping that they get a closer walk with Jesus than we have. Because that's what God will do. He'll bring non-believers in our path. We get excited to share the truth. And they will actually reveal to you what your life can look like. Because they get that first love encounter with Jesus. And it's a humbling experience to see someone that was just baptized days ago, months ago, weeks ago, years ago. That have more fire and more enthusiasm. You just want to be around them. Because it rubs off on you. Hello? 
you want to be around them. That's why I love doing evangelism. I love to be around new believers because their faith is hot. Their love is exciting. They're enthusiastic and I don't need to tell them, act enthusiastic and then you'll be enthusiastic. No, they've got that fire burning within them. They can't wait to share with somebody. And they're calling me up, Pastor, can you come over and help me do these Bible study series in my community? I says, okay, I'll do it. But I might not be able to be there with you for many weeks. I'll help you get started, but God's going to use you. Well, I don't know whether I can do that. I said, no. Is God calling you or not? Yes. Well, then do you have faith he'll do something called grace in you? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, that's all I need to know. Because you don't want to start training children to eat and then have to feed them until they're 100 years old. What we do in here should be creating disciples that creates disciples that creates disciples that lead people to Jesus. Remember those are the two principles we started off with yesterday. Everything you do in church, in every worship service, ought to be doing that. Creating disciples that create disciples that create disciples that lead people to Jesus. Not to us, not to Seventh-day Adventism. Because there won't be any tisms in heaven. That was rare, the amens, but I hope you're all thinking that. There won't be. There'll be one body of Christ. One body of believers. And for many, Ellen White says, that'll be their first Sabbath they ever kept in heaven. So there's going to be a lot of setting wrongs right in heaven. Especially for that thief on the cross that died just a few minutes after he accepted Jesus. Or whatever time it took him all right i'm preaching again number uh, b11 is what text okay matthew 24 35 and the first thing you do when you land there and then uh 35 24 35 not 25 35 24 35 and this sticker has an unusual thing on it. What is it? And. And. All right. So if you have that on this verse, you've successfully gotten an A in your first sequence of the Bible marking program. Someone want to put up your hand and read aloud, please. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Who's speaking it? Jesus stating a prophecy. Stating a prophecy. I don't know what flavor your church is. I just pray that you don't have the flavor of people not believing anymore in prophecy seminars. Prophecy seminars is what still interests people if it's done correctly and if we're excited about what we're sharing again enthusiasm is important all right so what principle can you get out of this verse come on shall not pass away all right how much are we looking i mean how big is that principle Two entities spoken of here that will not move. What? Heaven and earth. Sky and earth will not pass away. Are they still here today? That's two of you. Go like this. It's still there. So is God's word still the same? Yesterday, today, and forever. God is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. His word will never, never, never change. Yet we're in an age where we can't even use pronouns like we used to. You know what I'm talking about. He, him, they, whatever. God's word doesn't change. I don't care how much we want it to change. I don't care if you have a 99% uh, majority rule that says it needs to change. God's word, his pronouns, his, his, his expressions do not change. He loves you yesterday, today, and forever. And you cannot change the love of God. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. This is what attracts the youth. Because you know what happens. 
Kids come to church, and if you're not looking, they're going to be playing music you don't like, and before long, they are our enemies because they're playing music we don't like. That's not God. Oh, but pastor, don't go there. If you die on the mountain called music, you're going to die, and you can't help others. I promise you, when Paul traveled to every single country, the music wasn't like Israel. Do I need to do another 360? Don't make me dizzy. When Paul went to every country on planet earth, when he died, he said he went to the entire world. And I can promise you, the music wasn't the same. About six months ago, I was in Turkey, and the music was very different. Very different. Honestly, this was one country I didn't prepare for when I went there. Generally, when I know I'm going to Africa, the Philippines, or wherever, the Middle East, I try to get myself climatized before I get there so that I don't feel foreign when I get there. Okay, now we need to erase this and put the next topic up if we can do that. And what is your next topic? Uh, erase it right here. Some, some goodies to erase with. Thank you so much. Sorry, what's the next topic? Climatizing. You're meeting with a person every time. They've not come to church. You're not pushing them to come to church. It should be a desire, not a pressure. It should be a desire, not a pressure. Because if you pressure them to come to church, you're going to be sorry you did. So you climatize. First time I went to Africa, I didn't climatize. I was, I was only three months in, in from being a plumber to going to school to be a pastor. While she's writing this up there, I'll get this story, and if I can do it real quickly. And I'm in a truck, a lorry, what they call a lorry. It's a big truck. It's a big flat bag where you can drive a backhoe up on it, okay? And I'm in this lorry, and I had already taken some other students with me, and I said, we're going to this town where we're going to preach the gospel. Praise the Lord. Wonderful opportunity. We're going out through the countryside of Tanzania, and I come over top of this mountaintop, and right below us is the beautiful night scenes of lights when we get close. Closer. Now remember, I didn't climatize. I, d I told the men, not to the other students, I said, don't overreact with anything you see, it's unusual. But I didn't realize what that meant. Because the closer we got to the city, all of a sudden we saw, started seeing 9, 10, 12 year old kids running out in front of this truck that's moving down into the city and the lights are causing these termites. What were they called? Termites coming out of these eight foot high sand mounds along the road and the lights were drawing them to the truck and the kids were putting their life at stake running in front of the truck because these termites were as big as dragonflies or praying manises and they're grabbing them plucking the wings off and sticking that live termite in their mouth and eating them that's exactly what I did in the back of that truck did you hear what she just did <laughs> What are they doing? And the truck driver laughed. He's a local. He said, that's their meal. It's a free meal. And it's full of protein. And then I realized John the Baptist ate locusts. Hello, you're with me. You know, we're, it, was out of my, it was out of my culture. And again, only three months out of climatize yourself to the person that you're trying to work with understand their lifestyle understand whether they're poor whether they're wealthy you need to ask God for wisdom to be able to bathe the Word of God in terminology they're gonna and this is what God gives you this is what God gives you again if a plumber can be a pastor all over the world like God has given us the opportunity praise God he can do greater things with you all right so now we're talking about what topic? God. God. Okay, so we've gone from the Bible to God. The next thing I want to help you with is learn the resistance. What's that word? Resistance. resistance. Anybody done any electrical wiring here? Anybody? All right, we have a couple electricians putting their hands up. It's very important you understand the resistance of wires that's why you have certain size wires you don't have the same size wires running to your electrical receptacle along the wire along the wall that goes to your dryer the dryer is much heavier to carry the electricity with little resistance okay so now you're setting beside someone that hopefully has a desire to study God's uh, I just gave you the answer to study the Bible because it is 
God's Word. If you've established that, if they've said yes to you along the way, if you've unpacked some of the meat, maybe not all the meat that we had on the whiteboard, but some of the meat, if you've unpacked it, they should have that desire. And again, if the Bible to them now is God's Word, then they ought to be ready to study about God. And remember, try to emphasize we're not going to learn everything about God because you're going to study it throughout eternity. And then I do this. As you study diligently and you find new things about God, the Holy Spirit gives you these thoughts. Would you please do something for me? I'm talking to the person sitting next to me. Would you text me? Would you email me? Would you call me and say, Pastor, Guess what I, no, not pastor now, just Lynn. Lynn, guess what I learned about God today? It's like praying. When you repeat something, you're connecting to God. You're plugging in the larger wire. You have less resistance. And the stronger your connection with God, the less likely you're going to get unplugged. One amen. I knew I'd get one. <laughs> Again, all of us should not be about becoming better Seventh-day Adventists. We ought to be better God-like people. Ready for Jesus to come at any time. All right. So, what's your, first, what's your um, icon there for it? Last one, it was B. What's this one? G. All right. Now here comes the quiz. I hope you got the answer right. Get ready. Here it comes. Where do you find your first verse? Oh, it sounds like you're speaking in tongues. Hold on, Adventist. Where do you find your first verse? In your code key, in the front of your Bible. You should not have a sticky in your hand yet. Yet. Because if you looked on your plastic sheet and you saw the first sticky that you can pull off, you're going to go to the wrong place. And you're going to put the same text on the same text you're looking up. And then you're going to go, what did I do wrong? You always teach the student to go to the code key. We need the code to turn the key. All right? Very important point. This is a mistake if we're not careful. Yes, they, we talked about the end. You must have stepped out for a minute. Okay, so we're now putting um, G, G1, which is what text? All right, Exodus 34. If you're there, say amen. All right, now you can get your sticky in hand. Very first, you're already ahead of me. I know you are, but some people aren't. Okay, Exodus 34. And verses 6 and 7. The lighting's off up here, so I'm, I'm trying to squint. It's not my, my vision isn't that bad, but it is in this lighting. Okay. Two verses, what are they? 6 and 7. Put your hand up if you'll read it quickly. Let's move along. We're going to get through this today. We have 40 minutes. Okay, we have a verse over here. What version are you reading from? Uh, New King James. Okay, go ahead. Verse 6. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord. God merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Okay. Remember the two principles? Number one, we should be creating disciples, disciples that are creating Disciples that are creating disciples. disciples. Number two, you're learning about a closer relationship with Jesus Christ, God. Yes, absolutely. Now, here it comes. Here comes the big question. What have you learned from the reading of those two verses about God? And I'd like you to start as close to the beginning as you can. Put your hand up, and I want you to start giving me feedback so we can get through this verse, and I don't do as much talking. 34, thank you. Yes, that's when the body works together. Thank you so much. Yes, sir, the man that read it. Tell me your name. 
All right, let the microphone get over there, Bob, and share it with the people who are watching online. Yesterday, we had 60, 60 plus people watching. Can you say amen? amen? Now, I hope they're not all campground people that don't want to come and join us. <laughs> That's okay. Wherever you are, I'm thankful you run. Yes? God's merciful. God is what? Merciful. merciful. All right, keep in mind. Okay, we'll go back to yours in a moment. Keep in mind. This verse is speaking to the invisible person beside of you that has never come to your church and doesn't know God yet. Now the question comes, here it comes, but we want to land our plane. Do we know God is merciful? I mean, Seriously, if we don't know God is a merciful God, we need to learn it now. Because you can't teach that to your Bible student if we don't know it. A merciful God takes us where we are. Hello. A merciful God loves a person still keeping Sunday. A merciful God is, is talking to, uh, no, a merciful God loves a person who's talking to the relatives in heaven. Or in purgatory. And on their birthday, they get on Facebook and talk to their dead relatives. A merciful God loves that person just as much as people who are going to church on Sabbath. And if we know that, and you're sitting beside someone that God loves, guess what? We will be merciful and love them in their present state of mind. Sometimes as Seventh-day Adventists, we've been tempted, and I've been in communities where we do that. I will love you if you accept this next Bible study I'm about to give you. But if you don't love it, then, you know, we'll come back together whenever you're ready to study the Bible again. And you better get your act together because you're not going to be in heaven if you don't study God's Word and accept the truth. God forbid. At this very breath we breathe, we need as much mercy as that person sitting beside us. Because we have all disconnected from God. We can't forget that. And when you get excited about that verse, because it speaks to me, not only is God merciful, but what's the next verb? Uh, uh, yes, verb that identifies God's characteristic. What? Gracious. Gracious. Now, some of you like the deep stuff, so bear with me for the next minute and a half as I share this with you. Get your pencils ready if you've got paper and pencil. I told you every breath you breathe, you have already received God's blessing. Do you know what blessing is? Leslie Harding, which was an Old Testament professor in Andrews University, I think 50 years ago, maybe longer than that. When I was coming out of plumbing, I had to catch up fast. I was in my mid-30s and all the rest of the students were 19, 20, 21. And I'm sitting in a classroom of young people coming out of high school in college. And I'm the old guy. I didn't have white hair there. But I had to hit the ground running. I had to really get my feet on the solid rock Jesus Christ because I'm the old guy. So three months into college, I went off to Africa. The other students didn't, but I knew I had, to, God called me and I had to get up to speed. And so I started listening to Leslie Harding, everything. I had more cassettes from him going way back, everything I could get a hold of. But he said this principle, get your pencil ready, here it comes. Blessing is this, divine, what's the word? Divine, divine empowering. Do we need God's power? divine empowering to fulfill say the word again that was three of you to what fulfill intrinsic functions say that all back to me again without me helping you oh we sound like we're speaking tongues again say it together blessing is divine empowering to fulfill intrinsic functions. Thank you. Thank you. You're a sister of faith. 
The word intrinsic, no plumber knows that. Most plumbers don't. If you're a plumber and knew it, praise the Lord, you're more educated than the average plumber. I didn't know what it was, so I had to quickly, I couldn't ask Google back then, I couldn't ask Siri back then, get the dictionary out. Intrinsic means that which a human being has been created to do with what you have right now. Do you get up in the morning and say, let's see, today I need, my heartbeat needs to be at 62, that's the good beat, but let's see, I'm going to do a mile run, so then it needs to go up to 120, maybe 180, depending on your weight, and, and so now I need to program that in. Do you do that? No. What happens? You've been intrinsically programmed by God to breathe at a certain pace according to the needs of the body. You've been programmed by God to have your heart beat as needed. You've been programmed to, by God that your muscles do what your brain tells it to do. Friends, you are blessed by God. Most people don't realize the blessing you already have been given. And if you doubt it, injure your leg to where the body says your left leg is injured. You see me hobbling a little bit. I was roller skating a few days ago and I slammed into the wall and this knee isn't cooperating. My daughter that's a nurse practitioner says, Dad, you injured your meniscus? Go, oh, don't tell me that. I'm drinking green super powder food and, and hopefully four days this is day five and it's getting worse instead of better. So whatever. We'll take care of that when I get home. My point is you've been created to do certain things. Your body does it. It's called blessing. Divine empowering to fulfill intrinsic functions. That's the human nature. We've been created with a gift to live. When you take in that breath of air, you get energy, you get life. You can do what you've been created to do as a human being. Now, in addition to that, the Word of God says you don't even have the desire as a human being to search for God. Now we need something called... Now we need something called... No, blessing already gets you up in the morning. All right, once you learn you're blessed, now you need grace. See, I know you guys are such good students. Grace is divine empowering to fulfill extrinsic functions. Extrinsic functions. Something happens, you get up in the morning and before you climb out of bed, as soon as you realize you're awake, thank you, Lord, for this day's life as I have it. That's grace. Because grace is like a giant electromagnet. It takes disconnected human beings who other people are praying for, and it bathes you with a magnetic force that draws you to God. Are you with me? That's what grace does. It's like a giant electromagnet. Your kids disconnected from God? Pray. God bathes them with grace. Can you say amen? The last thing the Bible says he will do with the entire human race before Jesus blows the trumpets, before the plagues fall, he bathes the entire world one more time. Not with blessing, but with grace. Isn't God merciful? When we understand that, we'll, try, we'll quit trying to make people Seventh-day Adventists and we'll be talking about a merciful God that is gracious. And you may be so bold in some circumstances to say to someone that loves you enough to understand you, listen, I'm praying for you and you know what happens when I pray for you? You're going to get a bath. Hello? And they're going to look at you like, what are you talking about? I get a bath every day. No, no, no. God's going to bathe you with magnetic grace. Watch it. And when it happens, you'll know what's happening. You'll have a God moment. 
And the more God moments they have, the more they'll be connected to God. And they'll know how much God loves them. Are you with me today? Do you understand what I'm sharing with you? Because it's, it's not for us to be the only faucet of God's love for that person beside of you. You need to connect them directly to God. So when they have God moments, they can say, Hallelujah! I don't need my instructor. However, I love him too or her. I, I just need to know God. And when they start having God moments, they'll become your receptacle to give you God's love as God is loving them. And you'll be praising God that God used you to connect them. And then they're already connected, experiencing the mercy and grace of God. And you've got an on-fire believer. Amen. The Holy Spirit begins doing wonderful things. And water comes out of the top of the rock. That'll hit you on the way home. All right. Stop preaching, Lynn. G2. What is it? First Timothy 2 4. Have you noticed around the room we have a different group of folks than we had yesterday? Just curiosity. Not all of you. Some of you came back, brought, but there is some new folks that are here today. All right, put your hand up, and the text is 1 Timothy. Going back to Paul's writings. And again, we're using a lot of Timothy because his name used to be. I mean, not Timothy's name, but Paul's name used to be Saul. Saul. And again, that's the greatest conversion story that you can find. And yet, he's the most enthusiastic person about Jesus. 1 Timothy 2, 4, the first thing you do is place... What sticker is placed on that? G3. We won't talk about the text yet. Just make sure it says G3. And that's on... 1 Timothy 2, 4. Someone read it. Put your hand up. He'll give you the microphone. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth? Okay. Now the first thing the student beside of you is going to say is what? Thank you. You see how we're coming together? You're filling in the blank. Who is this who? So what do you need to do? Who? Go back where? One verse. And who is the who? All right. Now, take the word who out and put in God does what? Ah. What's the topic we're studying? What did the Bible verse just tell you about God? He wants that three-letter word. What is it? Come on. How many is that? How many is that? Everybody. Not just good people. Here's going to test your faith. You look into the face of your Bible student, whether across the table, and say, Do you have enemies? Do you have enemies? Not that you made them your enemy, but do you have enemies? Yes. Now here comes the crux. We're learning about who? God. You were created in his image. Here comes the crux. Here comes the difficult hill climb. Do you want your enemies in heaven? That was three of you. <laughs> Ooh. I won't read too much into that. Who wishes, Amplified says, who wishes all mankind to be saved. I have had many people tell me, Lynn, if that verse is true, I don't want to go to heaven. Because if God's taking my enemies to heaven, it's not a place I want to be. Do you see the problem? This is your resistance. Somehow we have to take that verse and bathe it in the language of love. Not human love. Not human love. Not human love. There's a word we all should be familiar with. It's agape. What is it? What is agape? Come on, quickly. What is agape? Love. What kind of love? God's perfect love that never 
never changes. All right. Somehow we've got to start putting in this love language from God that teaches this person that doesn't know God. They're trying to learn about God. And you, you ask them questions that get them to say what word? Y. E. S. Every time you can get them to say yes. What question can we ask them to get them to say yes about this verse? Come on, help me out. I'm getting you to think deeper today. Remember, we're trying to emphasize the agape love of God, right? Yes or no? Okay, indirectly teaching them about God as the verses will continue and teach them about God. But again, you're trying to get them to say yes. So what question can you ask them about this verse and the principle they're in? Ah, oh. sister, tell us again. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Huh. Wow, I need to write that one down. What did you say? Ah, oh, do you want God's love? Okay, now tie that in with the verse. The principle that God wants even our enemies in heaven. Okay, do you want God's love? Let's build on that. How would you tie that in? You got it. Just share it with me. Help him out. Do you want God's love? It's a starting point. How do you tie that in with God wants everybody in heaven? Do you want to go to heaven? Okay, do you want God's love? They would say, yes. Okay, do you want to go to heaven? They would say, yes. Okay, then what would you say with this verse? Remember the resistance. Oh, oh, oh. Is that going to get him to say yes? You're, you're correct, sister, and I'm with you. I, we're on the same page. But remember, we're trying to get him to say yes. Come on, help me. God wants what? Your love. I'm repeating it when they can't get the microphone faster. Say it again. God, God wants your love as much as he want, as I lost it. God wants, God wants your, your love, love as, as much as you want his love. Okay. God wants your love as much as you want his love. Okay. Okay. But remember, let's try and get the yes out there. These are good points. I'm not, there is no wrong answer here. You're going the right direction. Can I help you? Because I don't want to belabor the point. You're right. He wants your enemy's love as well. Okay. So... Here, yes, ma'am. That has no hate in him. Oh, that's a good. I, I I really like that. I really like that, and I could go somewhere with that one. No one but, for the songs, for the guys. Say it louder, honey. Oh yeah, say the say the statement again. I'm sorry. Thank you, honey. In the microphone. The microphone's not working. Don't it? you want to serve a God no, that working. has no hate in him? Don't you want to serve a God that has no hate for others? Okay. These are all excellent points. And I hope this is recorded. You can go back and rewind it. There's some powerful principles here. This is the way I would manage it. And I don't have the only way. God's going to give you the wisdom that you need in the right time. Do you believe that? Amen. Yes. Yes. It's a good place to say yes. All right. Here it comes. Looking at the person that hasn't met God, I would say it's something like this. Do you believe it's possible that God loves his enemies? Based upon what we just read. Remember, we just spent the last study on the power of God's word. Amen? There's power in there. It's what changes it. gets right into the crux of who we are. And our crux right now that we need to get into is... Do we love our enemies? Okay, so is it possible with agape love that we need from God that he loves his enemies? Yes or no? All right, so now tie that in with what the verse just told us. God wishes that all men be saved. Okay, and then I would go into a real brief principle that when we get to heaven, the first thing God's going to begin to do is set wrongs right. And the enemies down here will not be our enemies up there. Amen. Because there will be no disconnection up there. Amen. And only God can heal us 
And listen to me carefully. The healing process is not as soon as we set foot in the gate. Because the Bible says the leaves on the tree of life are for the healing of the nations. I love spinach leaves. Whenever I go to, to uh, Subway, I tell them, put plenty of spinach leaves on my sub. I want them as thick as you're allowed to put them on there because when I eat spinach leaves, there's a whole story of how they've healed me in the past. And so when I go to heaven, I'm going to say, at Subway, I'm going to say, I, I need some of the leaves off. No, I'm not going to be a Subway up there, but anyway. I'm going to go on over to that mango tree and have a mango and then I'm going over to the tree of life and have me a good old leaf and I'm sure in heaven the leaves will be awesome. That's one person. You just can't imagine eating leaves off a tree, can you? Oh, it almost took me to the story of Africa with the elephant. Okay, going on. To perceive and recognize, uh, am I in the wrong place? First Timothy 2, 4. All right. Wishes all men to be saved. First point. And my Amplified goes on to say, and to perceive and to recognize and discern. Three points there. And to know. Fourth point. Precisely and correctly the what? Truth. One voice up front. The truth. truth. The resistance in that point. You know what high society is teaching. High education teaches truth is relative thank you sister in other words there is no truth it's all relative for the people that believe this way truth is this way how dare we say the bible teaches the truth and that's dogmatic you old-fashioned christians that's the resistance so keep that in mind when you're sitting down sharing these principles with a college student that hasn't been to church and has never gone to church and doesn't know God, but yet they like your personality, you have something that they want, you're sitting down and as soon as you say that word truth, you're going to see their, their smile increase a little bit. And you're going to remember or you're going to expound on that word. And how I would do it is I say, now listen, I understand that you've been taught truth is relative. In other words, it's very... There's, there's not one truth. But for the sake of this book, for the sake of our study together, can I ask you to do one thing? And they're going to say, yes. yes. Hello. Because they've said yes how many times? 20 times already. You're going to get them to say yes. Can I ask you to do one thing for the sake of this time that we have together? And they're going to say, yes. Very likely they will. If they're not, the resistance is bigger than you thought. Can I ask you to do one thing during this study? And they're going to say, yes. For the sake of this study, in this context of the time we have together, when the Bible says truth, it's talking about something that doesn't change. When you're reading this book, there is a definite truth. You've got to take the resistance away. And then I'd say, when you're out in your world and you're talking to others about other things and you want to make truth, uh, uh, you know, truth fluid, okay, or relative, that's fine. But when we open up this book, we have to remember that truth is a defined article. Otherwise... This is where you will disconnect from the Bible. And that's called baby faith. If they won't accept baby faith, it's a gift. If they won't accept baby faith, then brothers and sisters, they are learning the knowledge of the word. And not the love of the word. All truth comes in two portions. Paul says, first of all, we're given the knowledge of the Word. It's a gift of God. Then second, we have to receive the second part of it. The love of the truth. If you don't receive the love of the truth, you're teaching someone to be a Jew that will never have an encounter with Jesus and you'll end up in a church of legalism. And I've been there. 
It's not a fun place to be. Truth comes in two parts. The knowledge of Jesus Christ and the love of Jesus Christ. The knowledge of the truth and the love of the truth. Without that second portion, if you don't get them to say yes willingly, they're leaving the love behind. They have not wanted to be changed and they're feeling the resistance and they don't want any part of it. And you better go back and emphasize the love a little harder. And if you don't have the love in your heart to share with them, friends, you need to get back on your knees before you spend another moment with that person. Because it's not something you have to do. You don't have to love this. You just need to receive it. It's a gift. All scripture comes in those two portions. All scripture. Either they receive the knowledge of the truth only and they become a legalist. Oh yeah, I know what the Bible says. In that book, the truth is just truth. I don't know. They didn't receive the love of that word. We'll be studying truth throughout eternity. And it will continue to grow. It's dynamic. But it never contradicts itself. What's that phrase again? And that's where I would plug in that principle. I can guarantee you this. If we ever read a verse in the Bible. Talking to this student beside of me. If I ever read a verse in the Bible that contradicts what we've already learned. You have permission to slam the brakes on and say no, 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 no. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The, over here we learn this, over here we're learning this, and they're hitting heads to each other. Pastor, no, not pastor, Lynn, you told me the Bible will never contradict itself. Never contradict itself. All 66 books tell us about God in the same way, shape, or form. When it's all said and done, it's agape love for his created. That's what we've got to lay down. Those principles, one step, baby step after another. If you get down to third or fourth study and they're not saying yes, they've left the love of those principles behind. And you've gone too far, too fast. And maybe because they've never experienced love in their life. Oh, G3. Got 15 minutes. Bear with me. I'm so thankful for you students who come, as I'm a student of the Word too. Um, our next text is? 1 John. 1 John. 1 John. 4, 8. If, you're gonna, if you have your hand up, the man will bring the microphone. Tell me your name, sir. Steve. Steve. Steve will bring the microphone to you and you can share. What's the text? 1 John 4, 8. All right. Microphone's not working yet. There we go. You have it. 1 John 4, 8 says what? Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he first, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. All right. 1 John 4, verse 8. Correct? 1 John 4, verse 8. Take the microphone back there again, please. That was a good verse, by the way. <laughs> I had that highlighted. That's why I read it. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Ooh, 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 ooh. Come on, these are one of these, um, these are one of these verses. What's the name of that movie that somebody told us about at breakfast this morning about the uh, king that didn't have clothes on? He had, they didn't want to talk about it. The Emperor's Clothes. Anybody heard that movie before? Forgive me for talking about movies, but this is one of those verses that brings in that principle that you're going to stand there naked before your Bible student. It's one of those epics in time you want to be ready for. What's the principle in this verse? Talking about who? Talking about who? God. And we are created in the image of God. Therefore, this verse says what? What's the key word in this verse? Love. If we are teaching doctrine to this student, if we're just going through the pages of these scriptures and trying to teach them doctrine so they become Seventh-day Adventists, you're going to be naked right now. Spiritually. And that's not a comforting thought. I used to dream 
Now, if you're a psychologist, don't tell me what this means. I don't want to know because I'm in Christ right now. Hallelujah. But I remember going to school, having dreams before I go to school in the morning that I ended up in school naked, sitting there. No, I was in my underwear, thank God. But I was in my underwear, sitting in my first and second grade class, and if kids are making fun of me because I didn't bring my clothes. If you haven't shared the knowledge of the truth and the love of what you're studying and you're not excited about every verse because you have the meat of that verse, you're going to sit there naked and they're going to say, they're thinking it, but they may not tell you, but you don't sound too much in love with those verses you're reading. And you're not expressing something that you're enthusiastic about. I just share that with you because, friends, hopefully when we leave this campground on Sunday... You've had a loving experience with God. A loving encounter with God. And you walk away not depressed because you're not as much as you want to be, but encouraged by the love of God that has bathed you with grace. You'll have blessing. You'll go home and you can say it every, every day. I'm blessed. But are you able to do things you never expected to do because you've been bathed in God's grace? When you're studying with that person that doesn't go to church, when you're trying to share the love of God's word with your children that doesn't go to church anymore, they need to see that you're in, in love with who? God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and his word, his communication to you. When they see that, then it will be a joy. And your conversations will go to places you never imagined. And you'll know it's a God moment right there. He who does not love has not become acquainted with God. Amplified says. Does not and never did know him. For God is agape love. That's all in the Amplified. It's all in the original Greek. I'm going to read it one more time. This is a powerful verse. He who or she who does not love has not become acquainted with with God. They're still in the garden, hiding in the bushes, hoping nobody discovers what they've done that's made them naked. Absence of agape love for other people. He who does not love has not become acquainted with God, does not and never did know Him. That's a positive phrase. Why? Because you do know God. You have known God. Hello? You have known God. You do know God. Just sometimes we get disconnected. And I love it where Ellen White says we're never judged according to a one event. It's the general tendency of your life. Hallelujah. Jesus comes, you are saved with the blood of Jesus. Not because of one event, but because the general tendency of what God has done through you. You keep going back. Keep being forgiven. You keep for, uh, forgiving other people. All right? So for God is love. So where does love come from? You're trying to introduce the person sitting beside of you to God. And he, they now know love comes from God. Do they want loved? Yes. They want love. They want to be loved. Therefore they want God in their life. And they should have said three times yes to that. And you say, hallelujah. Let's go to our next text, which would be G4. And what are, where is that at? Oh, come on. You can do this one by the back of your hand, right? Everybody knows that. But you know what? There's a lot. There is a lot that most people do not unpack in that verse. And I don't know if we're going to have time because we have six minutes. You could do a 10-hour sermon on this verse. John, what is it? 3.16. Yeah, I want to make sure G4 says that. When you get to John 3.16, you should have stuck in there G, G5. That's right. All right. 
You have your hand up. Say your name, what version you're carrying. Do you know what version uh, you're carrying? Desiree and New King James. New King James, okay. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. All right. Now, I hope you give me permission to unpack it with Amplified because this one's big. This is one that we've memorized. We teach it to our children. It's even in memory verses many times. But friends, we've got to stop. And we have to chew on it like the best food that you enjoy. And I won't say what that is. Some of us are in different places than others. We're being bathed in agape love. Amen? All right. Comes the food. All of a sudden we start dividing. Here we go. Verse 16. Here's what's said in Amplified. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized. Come on. You're sitting beside the person. It's invisible that doesn't know God the way they'd like to know God. They want to learn to love the church people and to have what church people have, hopefully. What did you just tell them? They are greatly loved. And they are dearly prized. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world. Woo! They're going, yeah, you think God loves me. You think God pri I'm God's prize. No, 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 no. Come on, that's just for good people. You don't know what I haven't told you yet. I don't need to know. Because he just said he greatly loved and highly, pr dearly prized the world. The world. Here we go, back to that enemy, agape love, grace, drawing everybody on planet earth to God. Do you see how there's so much more to unpack and to chew on that we'll be studying his love throughout eternity? Because God says, you don't understand, you're trying to hang out with the people you like to be around. I'm telling you, I love everybody. And I created you in the image of God. And when you let me bathe you with grace, get ready. You will love the world. You will be in the world, but not of the world. And yet you'll love everyone in the world. I have had too many Adventists ask me, Pastor Lynn, why do you go on these mission trips? There's a lot of work to be done just in the United States. Why are you spending so much money going over and preaching and teaching in other parts of the world? We need you here. Hmm. Do you know what happens in a foreign country when an American with white skin comes over there and talks about the love of God? Go to my Facebook page and look and the first picture will tell you. I'm standing in a cow pasture on Saturday morning, Sabbath morning. I got there on Friday night, and I wasn't planning on preaching, teaching for 11 days, uh, 8 days, 8 days. And I thought I'd go to my hotel and get climatized because it was about, I don't know how many hours difference, I've forgotten now, maybe 6, 8 hours difference. And um, I thought I need to get over this jet lag. I'm gone. I got there a week early, and so I went to my hotel, and on the way, the taxi driver says, by the way, i got to take you by the field where you're preaching tomorrow morning. Oh, I had to battle with my human nature. Go to the Facebook page and you will see something that will bring tears to your eyes. Because I got, we, we go down this dirt road and it's hardly wide enough for a car to go down this dirt road. And I'm thinking, what in the world? Who would ever put a church out here in the middle of this bush country? And then all of a sudden the car comes to a stop on a dirt road. And I look down the dirt road and look back the dirt road. You can't see a house anywhere. And he looks in his rearview mirror and he gives me one of these African smiles. He says, Pastor, this is where you're preaching tomorrow. I said, what, sir? This is where you're preaching tomorrow. I said, where? On this dirt road? He says, no, look to your right. There was an opening big enough for maybe two people to walk side by side. And inside of it, now I was, I was a dairy farmer's son until I was 12 years old. It's another whole story I'll share with you another time. I looked through the break in the brush. And what did I see? Cows in a 20 acre field and cow pals, you know what cow pals are? Everywhere in that field. And he said, In there, Pastor. 
Okay, I'm going to eat humble pie tomorrow. I didn't say cow pals, humble pie. It means I'm going to have to preach in a place that I didn't expect to preach. The unexpected. We get out of the car, I walked around the car and walked through that green break in the brush. And I looked inside. Somebody at the bottom of this amphitheater type hill, 20 acres, had dug four holes, stuck posts in it, and nailed a log that was cut in half on top of these logs, and that's where I was going to stand and preach tomorrow morning. And I'm sorry, I I had to ask him, I said, sir, forgive me. Forgive my unbelief. I said, where are the people going to come from tomorrow? I said, there's no houses for the last... 15 minutes of driving in this taxi he said oh don't worry don't worry they'll be here tomorrow an hour before I was supposed to preach we're riding in that same taxi cab with the same driver and we got a mile away from that place the dirt road was covered with so many people that we couldn't drive to the spot where I was supposed to speak And they were all going to hear this white American come and preach. And as true as I stand here, when it was time for me to preach, I was so choked up by the thousands of people that I couldn't speak. I I told them, I said, I'm sorry, I I can't speak. Why, Pastor? I said, I've never seen this before in my life. Poorer people than I can describe to you. Coming in pure white clothing. I don't know where they get wash machines to get their whites looking as white as they have. Because they wash them in dirty rivers. And they are all filing in. And you look at the Facebook page. There were over 5,000 people there that day. And finally when I started speaking. I, I preached. You know how long do I preach? One hour. one hour. See you know me well enough. I've only been here two days. I preached for one hour. And I thought Phew, okay I'm done. I sat down. The choir stood up and sang a vivacious song. I mean, the African choirs, hello, you don't hear music, and they don't have a single instrument. They get up and preach from their heart, uh, not preach, sing from their heart. And there's a number of them. They're all dressed in like, it's, it's awesome. I can't even describe it. Peggy could tell you more. And then they come to me and said, Pastor, are you ready to preach? I said, what? Are you ready to preach again? True as I stand here, they made me preach six one-hour sermons. And on the front row, you will see in the picture, there were hundreds, maybe a thousand young people from the age of two or three years old on up to be the adults. And they sat there the entire time, never asked for a drink of water. They never asked for a piece of food or a snack. Their parents weren't anywhere in contact with them. They sat there in loving obedience to this American. What I'm trying to tell you, friends, is there are people all over the world that are starving for the truth. Starving for the truth. And that's what we have to remember. Too many of us are stuck in our churches that we hardly can keep the doors open. I don't know what's happening in your church. I don't know you that well. I challenge you. One of the ways you'll electrify your church Raise enough money to go on a mission trip. And you'll come back excited for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you will see others. Even if you're the poorest person in America, you will be the richest over there. Now again, we're all human beings and we judge one another according to how much we look like we're wealthy. But in the eyes of God, we are all blessed. And he wants to fill us with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your presence today. And thank you for my brothers and sisters. I know in this room are people that will do awesome things before that trumpet sounds. Because your Holy Spirit is just waiting on us to trust you completely. And recognize those God moments that you will give us. Today 
and every breath we breathe until the trumpet sounds. We always thank you in the holy name of Jesus. God's people said... Amen. It's 12.35. Forgive me for going over five minutes. Thank you for writing on the board. Come back tomorrow. Invite a friend and continue in God's Word. What do you say? I hope you've been blessed today.